Friends, welcome to this daily devotion. I'm Mark, and I'm glad you've joined us. Just take a moment. Take a breath. Center yourself as we seek to grow in the love of God and neighbor. Friends, hear the invocation. Almighty God, you have created us, called us, chosen us to be your people. We wait now to receive your word of guidance and blessing. Grant unto us ears to hear, eyes to see, and faith to respond to your love and leadership. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, our theme this week is chosen by God. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are chosen. How does that make you feel? How does that challenge you? How does that comfort you? How does that, is it something you can even accept right now? I hope you can live with that theme a little bit this week. It, it's a beautiful theme. It's a challenging theme. And I think it leads to good life, great joy. Our theme Psalm has been Psalm 126. Uh, Today, we're just going to take a kind of two and a half verses, let's say. Psalm 126, a pilgrimage song. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful shouts. God bless the reading of the Psalms today. I love this psalm. It's it's very short. It's very simple. But but it it's reflecting on on good times as opposed to bad times. Uh, and this is a pilgrimage song, so it's a song that people would sing as they were heading to kind of Jerusalem during high holy festivals. Um, and so it's a song they would sing kind of on the way of to there or, or on the way up to the temple and things like that. Um, at least that's what we kind of imagine. And I just love the imagery. When things got better, it was like we had been dreaming. It was like all that terrible stuff was a bad dream. And suddenly everything was okay. I don't know how you've experienced that in your life, but certainly I've been through some very challenging times. And uh, my family's been through some exceptionally challenging times. And yet I don't, and I know some people do. Some people really live and just let let all of the bad things just just define their life. Uh, and they let that eat at them and they can't let that go. And, and it, it's, it causes a lot of pain, as Pastor Wesley's been talking about with forgiveness. I mean, it, it hurts us. But in my experience, there is that moment when you're on the other side of whatever storm, whatever tragedy, whatever whatever grief, and all of that seems like a dream. Like, did that even happen? And there's, there's a moment of joy. And I know when we're talking about, I mean, grief is ongoing, things like that, but I'm, I'm really talking about tough times. I mean, you know, the, the psalmist most likely referring to, you know, uh, Israel's exile into Babylon, things like that. Uh, and so thinking about those kind of tough times and, and coming back on the other side and just living into that joy. And, and some people really struggle to do that because it's, it's sometimes it's just easier to, to just be negative. It's easier to be down on yourself. It's easier to, to just, Oh, this is terrible. This is bad. This is no good. And as opposed to saying, wow, we made it through. Things are looking up. And yeah, there's probably another storm around the corner, but right now, right now is a time of joy. And when you have those moments, that's that's when you come around other people and and, and you lift them up during their storms and, and you encourage them and you find ways to 
to just just be with them and listen and sit and and offer something if you can to to remind them that they are loved that they are chosen that god loves them there's nothing they can do about it our anthology reading today comes from the art of prayer let us then take care not to quench the spirit all evil actions extinguish the slight, slander, offenses, and the like. The nature of fire is such that everything foreign to it destroys it, and everything akin to it gives it further strength. The light of the Spirit reacts in the same manner. This is the way in which the Spirit grace, a Spirit of grace manifests itself in Christians. Through repentance and faith, it descends into the soul of each person in the sacrament of baptism, or else is restored to him in the sacrament of repentance. The fire of zeal is its essence, but it can take different directions according to the individual. The spirit of grace leads one person to concentrate entirely on their own sanctification by severe ascetic feats. Another it guides preeminently to works of charity. Another it inspires to devote their lives to good organizations of Christian society. And another it directs to spread the gospel by preaching. As, for example, Apollos, who, burning in the spirit, spoke and taught about the Lord. I like this imagery of, uh, you know, here in the Methodist Church, we uh, are symbol, the United Methodist Church, our symbol is a cross and a flame. The flame represents the tongues of fire uh, that descended upon the disciples of the uh, early church on the day of Pentecost, uh, giving them the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we often use that uh, imagery of fire to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so uh, what the author is doing here is saying, like fire, anything that feeds the fire that's akin to it helps it grow. Anything that's counter to it, it quenches it, extinguishes it. And the Spirit's the same way. When we feed the Spirit, it grows. It, it, it moves us to these different paths. And they're different. There are many parts, one body, right? Uh, we're, we're all called to different things. We're all chosen for different things. But often we quench it and do things that don't add to the spirit, that starve the spirit, that deprive it of the, that life-giving oxygen that the fire needs. Don't hide it under a bushel basket, right? <laughs> Let that light shine. Great encouraging words. Our scripture today comes from Isaiah, Isaiah 45, uh, starting in verse 1. A little story about Cyrus. The Lord said to his anointed, to Cyrus, whom I have grasped by the strong hand, to conquer nations before him, disarming kings and opening doors before him, so no gate will be shut. I myself will go before you, and I will level mountains. I will shatter bronze doors. I will cut through iron bars. I will give you hidden treasures of secret riches, so you will know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and, my, and Israel, my chosen, I called you by name. I gave you an honored title, though you didn't know me. I am the Lord. There is no other besides me. There is no God. I strengthen you, though you don't know me. So all will know from that the rising of the sun to its setting, there is nothing apart from me. I am the Lord. There is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make prosperity and create doom. I am the Lord who does all things. Pour down, you heavens above, and let the clouds flow with righteousness. Let the earth open for salvation to bear fruit. Let righteousness sprout as well. I, the Lord, have created these things. God bless the reading of uh, Isaiah, of the prophet, uh, today. So so uh, uh, kind of a prophecy here about Cyrus, who uh, was ruling over what was Babylon when Babylon conquered uh uh, Israel uh, and brought them into exile. So now Cyrus is ruler of that entire area. And and, and the prophecy or, or the, the word from God is that Cyrus had been appointed for this time. Even though Cyrus was not um, a Hebrew person, 
Cyrus was not a God-worshipping person or not a worshiper of Yahweh, of this God, um, that God would choose and use Cyrus for a specific ministry. And isn't that interesting? And, and we see this all kinds of times, and, and there are different ways to interpret this. And so um, sometimes we read that into other people, and I think that can be dangerous, uh, unless you're a prophet. Uh, <laughs> that can be very dangerous. Uh, like if I say, oh, this person in leadership has been appointed by God, and, and I think that becomes dangerous. Um, we're not God. Most of us aren't prophets in the way Isaiah was a prophet. So let's back off that for a second. Uh, but that doesn't mean that God can't use people for good. And that doesn't mean in our tradition, in, in the United Methodist and wrestling understanding, everyone has availability to God's grace. We call it pervenient grace, that the grace of God exists in all people. And so when you say, well, how can, how can people who uh, don't believe in anything or aren't Christian or are atheist or agnostic, how can they do good? Well, because the grace of God lives in all, all people. All people were created good. All people were uh, offered salvation by Jesus Christ. The grace of God exists in all people. So all people can be used for good. And we see that throughout Scripture. Uh, and some people who, who have done terrible, terrible things, God calls and says, I know what you've done. I mean, Saul is a great example. I know what you've done, but I'm choosing you. And if you follow me, you're going to do great things. Uh, he becomes Paul and, and starts kind of the church in the Western world. And, and there are so many stories like that in Scripture where God reaches out and chooses someone who doesn't necessarily qualify to be chosen, who doesn't seem worthy or worthwhile, and yet God chooses them. I mean, Mary is a great example, the mother of Jesus. Here's this uh, young woman, you know, how we don't know exactly how old she is, uh, but we do know she's from a nothing town, uh, from a nothing family. She has no status. She's poorer than dirt. Uh, she's not even started her life, really. You know, she's not married. Uh, she doesn't have children, so she doesn't have any status. And God says, I recognize how important you are, how good you are, how faithful you are. I recognize your adventurous spirit. I recognize that there's something in you. And I would like you for this task. And she says, yes. And it's a beautiful story. But she was not the likely candidate to be the mother of Jesus. And so I, I, I would say for you... <laughs> If you ever get down on yourself and say, well, I'm not, I'm not good enough for this ministry that I feel called to, or, or somebody said, hey, you should do this, but I'm, I'm just not, I'm not gifted. I'm not equipped. The answer is probably right. You're not. <laughs> and yet you're chosen. And if you recognize that chosenness and you allow yourself to say yes, You'll be given everything you need. I truly believe that. The first step is really acknowledging that regardless of where I've been, regardless of what I've done, regardless of how skilled I or talented I am, God is calling me to do something. God has chosen me for a time such as this. Friends, today I offer you an opportunity for confession. Confession is an act of letting go. It's an act of seeking forgiveness and receiving. Hopefully it moves us to making amends, to apologizing, and to moving forward. Let us now bring to God all those things we would confess. Friends, hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Let us move forward, growing in love, love of God and love of neighbor. 
Let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I leave you with these words from John Wesley. O Lord, may nothing dwell in my soul but your pure love alone. Till my every thought, word, and act be love. Yes, Lord, may your love possess me whole. You're my joy, my treasure, my crown. Until next time, friends, God bless. Goodbye. Amen.